So it's my real privilege to introduce Dr. Walt Larimore. Walt is an internationally recognized family physician who's been listed in Who's Who in the, in the world, in the International Health Professionals of the Year, in the International Health Scientists of the Year, and the 2000 Intellectuals of the 21st century. So quite an introduction. He is also a nationally awarded physician educator. In fact, has been named Educator of the Year by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations and the American Academy of Family Physicians. In his spare time, you might wonder if he has any spare time, but in his spare time, he's become a best-selling author of over 40 books and also has authored over 35 medical textbook chapters and over 1,000 articles in dozens of professional journals and lay magazines. But uh, what will tell you the most important thing in his life, apart from his Christian faith, is that he and Barb, his wife, have been married for nearly 50 years, have two adult children and two beautiful granddaughters. So, Walt, it's it's a real pleasure to have you on ICMDA webinars, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, brother. Peter, thank you so much. I remember when we first met, uh, gosh, 25 years ago in London, and it was such a treat for me to be part of today's seminar. And, and welcome, brothers and sisters from all over the world. I come to you from the beautiful Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and I look forward to meeting each of you, either somewhere on this globe or in heaven one day. But until that time that we're together in eternity, each of us has the privilege of being salt, prayerfully that is flavorful, and light, prayerfully that is attractive to those that are called into our healthcare. And today I have the opportunity to share with you some information on how you can bring God into uh, each session uh, when you see uh, patients and colleagues. But today we're going to talk very quickly about six topics, the biblical case for prayer, the clinical case for prayer, cautions about praying with patients, opportunities for prayer for patients, and opportunities for for prayer with patients, and then the obligation we have as, as followers of Jesus to pray with those that we see. So first, the biblical case for prayer. I will not quote each of these verses. They'll all be available for you in the handout, but just some of the reasons that God gives us for praying. First of all, he prescribes it for us as Christians, and he prescribes that we pray continuously. And God prescribes prayer for the sick. In James, he says, is anyone sick? He should be prayed for. And God prescribes prayer for our time of need and our patient's time of need and gives us the privilege of approaching boldly the throne of grace with confidence that we can get mercy in the time of need. And God cares about the physical world, and he cares about human bodies. And the Apostle John prayed that we all would enjoy good health and it would go well with us, even as our soul, our mind, emotion, and will is getting along well. God hears our prayer, and he answers our prayer. And we have that confidence when we approach him boldly. Now, the answer may be yes, it may be no, or it may be wait, but he hears and we have that confidence. And we all know that ultimate healing comes from a relationship with God through Christ, and that one day every one of our and every one of our patients' tears will be wiped away, and there'll be no more death, and no more mourning, and no more crying, and no more pain, and no more suffering in our future state. Prayer is a powerful clinical tool. And as righteous people, not righteous through our own deeds, but righteous through the sacrifice of Jesus and because of his blood, if we are confessed of our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and grant to us, impute to us God's righteousness. And therefore, our prayers are powerful and they're effective. Now, there's a clinical case for prayer. It's just not a theological precept for us, but we have data 
And we have science that backs the practice of prayer in clinical care. And I want to start first with an area of controversy. And it's about the randomized controlled trials that have been done on the topic of intercessory prayer. And this literature is very problematic. I'm going to tell you why it's problematic. And then I'm going to tell you why uh, we can why we don't have to have randomized controlled trials. So first of all, there have been over a dozen randomized controlled trials of prayer. And some of them show statistically significant positive benefits from, from intercessory prayer, irrespective of the faith of the patient. But there have been several trials, including the largest trial, and the most rigorous trial, which was performed by researchers at Harvard University in the United States, that have been negative. So why have some of the trials been positive and some of the trials been negative? Why are the results mixed? It's very simple. Every single published randomized controlled trial on prayer fails to meet several critical respects. In fact, probably none of them should have been published. And here's why. And I'm quoting now a critical review by Dr. Sloan. He says, primarily, these RCTs, these randomized controlled trials, fail to measure and control for exposure to prayer from others. In other words, if we take a group of patients and we separate them, one half of them don't get intercessory prayer, and one half of them do get intercessory prayer. Those who don't get the intercessory prayer, we have no way to know what family members are praying for them. If they're in a church and church members are praying for them, or if there's uh, chaplains in the hospital that are praying for the hospital, praying for the patients, we don't know that. So it's not truly a controlled trial. Think of it this way. If you live in a country where antibiotics can be bought without a prescription, and many countries around the world, antibiotics can be bought in pharmacies without a prescription. So suppose you want to do a study on strep throat, and you want to compare penicillin to not giving penicillin, right? And she set up a randomized controlled trial. But you have no way of knowing of the patients who get the placebo. Did they go to the drugstore and buy penicillin? And so your randomized controlled trial is inadequate. So even though the randomized controlled trial data, data cannot guide us as Christian healthcare professionals, either for or against intercessory prayer, there is some very important clinical literature that we can consider. And let me just give you a few of hundreds of studies. So we've known for almost 15 years, a decade and a half, with this study with Dr. Curlin and his colleagues at the University of Chicago found that most of our patients draw on prayer and other religious resources to navigate and overcome the challenge that arise in their illnesses. And for our very sick patients, those who are receiving intensive care, there are virtually no atheists. There are very few agnostics. When people become ill, especially critical here, ill, they begin to think about eternal things, and they begin to draw on prayer. We've known for over two decades that religious beliefs and prayer are commonly used by our patients to distress caused by health problems. Religious beliefs in prayer give meaning to illness. They promote hope for recovery. They provide rituals and behaviors that bring individuals together and relieve and settle anxiety. And we know that from at least in, in the United States, and I suspect this is true in your country, that patients desire their healthcare professionals pray for them, and especially the sicker they are. In this one study, when routine office visit, about 40% of patients agree that doctors should offer prayer. When they're hospitalized, that goes up to almost 70%. And if it's life-threatening, it's almost 100% of our patients and their families desire to have their healthcare professionals offer prayer for them and with them. And most physicians believe prayer is positive in healthcare. 
76% of physicians surveyed say they believe it helps their patients cope. And 74% believe that it gives their patients a more positive state of mind, which reduces length of stay and improves healthcare outcomes. And over half believe that prayer provides emotional and practical support through the patient's religious community. But there are cautions that you need to be aware of when it comes to praying with patients. These are common sense precautions, ethical precautions, and in many countries, legal precautions. My dear friend, uh, Harold Koenig, he's a family physician who then became a geriatrician and then became a psychiatrist at Duke University. He's head of their uh, division of religion and health, and he's probably the most published researcher in the world when it comes to religion and spirituality in healthcare. And when it comes to praying with patients, he suggests six cautions for all of us. First, and this is quoting him, contemplating a spiritual intervention, such as praying with patients, should always be patient-centered and patient-desired. It's never pushed upon a patient. It's never foisted upon a patient. It is with the patient's concurrence. Secondly, the health professional should never do anything related to religion and spirituality that involves coercion. It's patient-centered spiritual care. Thirdly, the patient has to feel in control and free to reveal or not reveal information about their spiritual lives or to engage or not engage in any spiritual practices such as prayer. Fourthly, the health professional may inform patients based upon a spiritual history that they are open to praying with patients if that's what the patient wants. Fifthly, the patient is then free to initiate a request for prayer at a later time or a future visit should they desire prayer with the health professional. And lastly, Dr. Koenig says, in most cases, health professionals should not ask patients if they would like to pray with them, but rather leave the initiative to the patient to request prayer. Now, I show you those six uh, precautions because they've been used against healthcare professionals who pray with patients. We know of at least four countries around the world where legal action has taken place, where healthcare professionals did not follow these precautions. But I want to also let you know that most faith-based healthcare organizations, including CMDA and ICMDA, in our experience, most Christian healthcare professionals are comfortable praying with patients in at least some clinical situations. In other words, most healthcare professionals who are followers of Jesus are comfortable praying with patients, or at least offering prayer even if the patient doesn't request it. And I'm going to navigate with you on how to do that. And this is even more true for healthcare professionals who either go through ICMDA's saline process or go, who go through CMDA's grace prescriptions or faith prescriptions, physicians, healthcare professionals, doctors who've gone through this training, almost uniformly feel comfortable and willing to begin to pray with their patients. At the end of our presentation, I'll give you specific information on how you can find all of these resources. So don't, don't worry about that. But if you choose to offer prayer with patients, here's the prerequisites that I recommend. Number one, be sure that you've taken a spiritual history, a spiritual assessment. Secondly, has the patient either requested prayer or have they consented to prayer? Have you offered it and asked for their permission? Do you offer prayer in that case with respect, with sensitivity to the patient, their family, their culture, their religious background, and with their permission? And then thirdly, does the situation call for prayer? As I've already told you, the more intense the situation, the more critical the situation, the more likely the patient will be open to prayer. And then discuss with the patient if they're open. Do they have any specific prayer requests they might want or any people with whom you can share that request? For example, Barb and I 
pray for my patients every morning. So I will ask for patients that want prayer. Is it okay if I share this prayer request with my wife so we can pray for you together? I will not share your name. I will not share your clinical information, but can we pray for you together? And then record the patient's request. If your healthcare system has a medical record, my recommendation is that you record that you did provide prayer at the patient's request. And that provides a written record for me because of my age and my memory. I want to remember that I prayed with the patient so the medical record helps me. But then it also serves as legal and ethical protection for you. Now, what about opportunities of praying for patients? This is one area that you don't need consent, obviously. And you can pray for, I pray for my patients during my daily quiet time. The Lord wakes me up between 4, 435 every morning. I wish he'd let me sleep a little longer some nights, particularly after call. But during my quiet time, I pray for, for my patients while traveling to and from the clinic that I'm privileged to serve in. I'm praying for my colleagues, I'm praying for my patients, and I'm praying for myself that God will give me wisdom and that he will speak in me and through me, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, with other believers at work or at worship uh, or via an electronic prayer mem memo, but for these last two, Remember patient confidentiality. In many of our countries, we're under legal guidelines to preserve patient confidentiality. I think we're under ethical guidelines, and I think we're under biblical guidelines to do the same, to protect our patients' confidence, but with permission to be able to call other believers to join us in praying for our patients. So that's praying for patients, but what about opportunities to pray with our patients. And there's so many that we have. For those of us involved in critical care, our critical counseling, our cancer counseling, our end of life counseling, or when we give our patients a critical diagnosis or a, a devastating diagnosis or a difficult diagnosis, it's a natural opportunity for us to pray because at that moment, our patients, even our atheistic, atheistic patients are thinking about eternity. I not only practice family medicine, but I teach family medicine. And at one of the residencies here in the United States, I was rounding with our patients, uh, with our residents in an intensive care situation. And the chief resident uh, took us to the room of a young man, he was in his 40s, who had suffered multi-organ failure from sepsis. And he had just been taken off the ventilator and was in the process of recovering. And the resident said, he's doing well. We think we'll discharge him from the intensive care unit today. Dr. Laramore, as the attending physician, I don't need you to see him. But I had trained our residents in how to do a spiritual assessment, a spiritual history for every patient admitted to the hospital. And I said, well, what's going on with him spiritually? And the chief resident said, well, he's an atheist and he's not really open to spiritual care. And I said to the resident, then I would like to see this young man because this could be a case I could report in the literature. The resident looked at me and he was kind of confused and he said, why? And I said, because I have in 40 years of practice, I've never seen a patient in the intensive care unit who's an atheist. So we walked in, I introduced myself to the patient, asked how he was doing. And then I said, the residents tell me that you're an atheist. He shook his head. And I said, have you had any thoughts about God since you were admitted to the hospital? And this patient said, oh, I'm talking to him every day. He was no longer an atheist. What about the return of difficult test results, an opportunity to pray during hospice or specialty referrals, an opportunity to pay, pray, even preventative care visits as a family physician. I care for pediatric patients who, who can't even speak, and yet I'll often pray with the mom or with the mom and dad in those well baby visits, prenatal visits or after the birth of the baby. In fact, when my partner and I began practice in 1981, that's how old I am, we first started praying with patients after we delivered babies, after we attended birth. My first uh, 
OB patient that I was going to pray with was a lady named Ruthie. I used her name with her permission. And uh, John Hartman, my partner and I were attending a birth together because we were doing a study on episiotomies. Anyway, Dr. John was the attending physician. I was the observing physician. And after the birth of the baby, uh, John kind of shook his head at me and I looked at Ruthie and I said, Ruthie, I don't know if you know it or not, but Dr. John and I have been praying for you and your husband and this baby for the whole pregnancy. And the birth of little Sarah is an answer to prayer for us. And would you mind if we gave a quick prayer of thanksgiving? And she looked up at her husband, Jimmy. I use his name with his permission. He shook his head. She looked at me. I, I, she shook her head at me. And brothers and sisters, I looked at Dr. John and I said, Dr. John, will you pray? Because I was afraid to pray with a patient. I had never done it. I'd never been trained to do it. And I, I pawned it off. I passed it off to my partner. And I tell you that to my embarrassment. But you may be, if you've never prayed with patients, this may be a scary or unusual thing, but have confidence in the Lord that he's gone before you. And Dr. John prayed for that patient. And Jimmy and Ruthie, till this day, will tell you, it's one of the most powerful, powerful things that ever happened to them when their doctor prayed for them and that newborn little girl. Preoperative visits and hospital visits. I once visited a patient. I had done a spiritual history on him. He had no spiritual interest at all. In fact, he was anti-religion. And he had prostate cancer. We were getting ready to operate on him. And I was the assistant as the family physician, but I went into the preoperative area and I knew he was, uh, he had an allergic reaction to religion. But after I checked that there were no questions that he and his wife would have about the surgery, I almost walked out of the room. But then I said to him, his name is Bob, and I use his name with his permission. I said, Bob, uh, you don't know me very well, but I want you to know that the most important relationship in my life is my personal relationship with God. And I have always offered prayer for my patients before we go to the operating room. And I know that prayer is not important to you, but I'm willing to offer prayer for you if that would be okay. And if not, that's okay. And I, my hands were holding on to the gurney and to my shock, Bob said, that would be fine. I, I, I was shocked. In fact, I'm glad I was holding on to the gurney because I think I probably would have fallen over. But I bowed my hair and head and I just said a short prayer. Uh, pray for the surgeon for guidance and pray for the family during the surgery for peace and pray for Bob for healing. And as I was praying for him, this was a very large, strong man. He reached up with one hand and he grabbed my two hands on the rail of the bed and he gripped them hard. And when I said, amen, he did not let go. And I looked up and he had big tears running down both of his cheeks. And he took his free hand and he wiped his cheeks. And then he looked up at me and he said, Dr. Walt, you're not going to tell anyone, are you? And I said, what, Bob, that we prayed or that you cried? And he said, know that we held hands. <laughs> About six weeks later, Bob prayed and asked Christ into his life. I wasn't there at his spiritual rebirth, but he to this day says that that was the beginning of his spiritual journey, was a prayer before surgery. And consider asking a patient to pray with or for you. If you know that you have a religious or spiritual patient who practices prayer before surgery or before a procedure, ask them to pray for you, to join you for their visit. Now, another option is praying at the end of each healthcare encounter. And I'm going to tell you, when I started praying for patients, I was uncomfortable with this. The partner I practiced with was very comfortable. He prayed at the end of every single visit. And I just didn't have that spiritual maturity at that point. I was afraid of what people might think. I'm embarrassed, my brothers and sisters, to tell you that, but, but it's true. And then one day, John, my partner, 
quoted Romans 1.16. He said, Walt, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And God used that, the Holy Spirit used that to convict me to begin the practice of praying with each patient at the end of each patient encounter. And as we close out our time with our patients, instead of just wishing them good luck or goodbye or see you next time, we could say something like, this is what I do. I know this is a lot to think about. I know that you're going through a lot. Would you mind if I briefly prayed for you about this? And brothers and sisters, over the last 25 years of praying with thousands and thousands of patients, I've only had three patients ever say no. And I respect that if they don't. For those who say yes, they often assume that I'm going to be praying later. But if they say yes, I say, may I pray briefly with you right now? Because a prayer spoken out loud with the patient directly to God on their behalf is a simple way of them beginning to understand the reality of being in the presence of God during this healthcare issue they're wrestling with. And it's very short. It's very simple. You may want to say something like, dear Lord, you know my patient is concerned, and I invite you into our trouble. I ask you to help that I would trust you and, and that my patient would trust you as you work out your plan. Amen. Or this is perhaps my most common prayer for my non-religious patients. Say, Lord, thank you for the privilege you've given me to care for John or Juan or Susie, give me wisdom as I care for them. Amen. The obligation to prayer is our final topic as I, we end my formal presentation. We go into the questions and answers. And the Apostle James says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Why? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Martin Luther King said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Hebrews says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us, to help our patient in the time of need. Charles Spurgeon, that famous preacher, said prayer can never be in excess. Whether our patients know it or not, for Christian healthcare professionals not to pray for their patients is as much a spiritual malpractice as for pastors to fail to pray for their flock. For a patient who desires prayer, a Christian healthcare professional's prayer for and with them may be as therapeutic as any other therapy that we can offer. And John says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 17th century theologian Samuel Chadwick says it this way, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, nothing from prayerless work, nothing from prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom. But ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, he trembles when we pray. Dr. Larry Dossie says, not to employ prayer with my patients is the equivalent of deliberately withholding a potent drug or a surgical procedure. And I love the old theologian, J. Sidlow Baxter, who says men, we could say people may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they're helpless against our prayers. So what is God's will? when it comes to us praying with our patients in clinical care? Well, let's turn to his word because it tells us, rejoice always, pray continuously, pray without stopping, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And are you now like I was early in my practice, leaving your prayer at the doorway when you walk into the healthcare facility? And if so, 
can this verse serve as a conviction, as a motivation to bring the power of prayer into every minute of every day with every patient? Because as Christian healthcare professionals, we have an extremely powerful healing resource that not all healthcare professionals know how to use. It's prayer. Brothers and sisters, use it. Use it intentionally. Use it wisely. And use it prayerfully. So for the last minute and a half or so, I want to share a few resources with you. These are all going to be available in your handout. The first is a review article on praying with our patients. It was originally published in Today's Christian Doctor in the United States. It's available at no charge, and the internet website is available in your handout. Uh, I do want to mention that several times in this presentation, I've talked about spiritual care. I've talked about spiritual interventions. And what I mean by that is besides praying with and for patients, do you know how to take a spiritual assessment or a spiritual history of every patient that you see? Do you know how to share faith flags or faith stories or faith prescriptions when indicated? Do you know how to share your personal faith story or your personal hope story or your personal uh, testimony when desired and when indicated? Do you know how to share the good news? Do you know how to share the gospel? Once again, when desired and when indicated. Do you know how to provide spiritual consults or referrals? And do you know how to do this within the reality of a very busy clinical day? If not, there's some resources I think you should be available. One's available from our ICMDA uh, in partnership with International Health Services. It's called the Saline Process. Uh, it's a healthcare witness training program. It's also available online. It's the Saline Process online training, our SPOT. This slide is not in your handout. I regret I didn't put it in the handout, but it's easily available to find this through ICMDA. And I think uh, Dr. Saunders is going to talk to us about getting that information to us. CMDA in the U.S. has the GRACE prescriptions. It's a course on learning to share your faith by incorporating spiritual care in healthcare, And the website for that is in your handout. It's a small group training course with 14 DVDs. It's available in English and Spanish. It has an instructor's manual and a participant's uh, notebook available. However, the, the module on praying with and for patients is available online at no cost. It's about a one hour presentation that I did in New York City. And I hope that'll be of help to you. Also uh, new from CMDA in the U.S. is a training program called Faith Prescriptions, training healthcare professionals to communicate the love of Christ in healthcare uh, settings. It's an internet-based video and discussion guide. About 14 of them have been produced, 25 are planned, a wide variety of topics, and the website for that is available in your handout. By the way, episode seven of Faith Prescriptions is about praying with and for our patients. And I look forward to interacting with those of you that have questions or comments. That's brilliant. And, and thanks uh, not only uh, for your wisdom and your testimony and your, your honesty about your own struggles too, but also for being so clear and so practical and leaving us with things that we can go away and put into practice. So we're going to uh, have a time of question and answer now. And uh, the first one, Walt, is about randomized controlled trials, which you, you mentioned. And it's more of a comment, really, for your comment. And uh, the writer is saying, I've got a problem with randomized controlled trials testing the effectiveness of prayer. Shouldn't we ought to just abide by the biblical command for prayer? Um, doesn't God and the sovereignty laugh about what we esteem to be the highest standard of evidence? Is it something that really should worry us or concern us at all? Uh, your thoughts on RCTs? Oh, what a wonderful question and challenge, and I, and I appreciate it. Uh, let me try to explain this shortly and briefly. One is that all true science originates in God's creation. It is the process of revealing not just truth, but God's truth. 
And so the two, in my view, are, are incompatible. But particularly for our colleagues or students who are not believers, if our faith and science, in fact, mesh well. And all the great scientists of history, whether it's Copernicus or Galileo, were believers who were seeking to show the truth of God's creation and, and God's revelation. And therefore, if we're challenged by those who say, well, why do you believe in prayer? I mean, the science disproves prayer. I wanted you to be able to have an answer for that, saying, no, it really doesn't. The science, the best science we have, the randomized controlled trial, simply is not designed to be able to discover the truth of prayer because of the reasons that, that I gave. But what the science does show is that our patients who request prayer, who give us permission for prayer, almost uniformly are comforted by it, benefit from it, knowing that their care provider depends upon a power, depends upon a wisdom, depends upon a source greater than themselves, that their surgeon getting ready to cut them open is seeking guidance and wisdom from the creator, not just of the body, but of the universe. And as I said, now, I'm in an area of the country that isn't as open to Christianity as many areas in the U.S., and yet, in all my years, I've only had three patients refuse prayer, and, and I'm fine with that, but with permission, with sensitivity, and with respect, most are. Great, great question. I appreciate that. And we've probably got people from over 60 countries listening in today, so a whole different variety. And the question here from the UK, in the UK, physicians have still been accused of taking advantage of a patient in being in a vulnerable position, even when raising spiritual matters without the subject being objected to, which understandably has made most of us very cautious. I, I have a feeling that the limited autonomy of doctors in the UK as a result of working in a state-dominated, non-transactional, micromanaged service does not encourage freedom in this regard, I also have the impression that religion is much more accepted in the public domain in the US where you are and suspect that many attendees will find themselves in an even more hostile environment than the UK. So the, the writer is saying, I'd, I'd appreciate your comments and advice on how to proceed wisely in an environment that's, that's perhaps more hostile than the US environment. Yeah, I, I, Peter, as you know, I've had the privilege to teach these principles in over 30 countries and interact with uh, healthcare professionals in over 60 countries about this exact question. And there is the perception that the U.S. is more open than many countries, and that's rapidly changed over the last two, two decades. But with any particular patient that we have, notice that I couched all of this under the guidance of taking a spiritual assessment first. A spiritual assessment or spiritual history is just part of your social history. As you ask of your patient their family history, where they work, do they use tobacco products? Do they use alcohol products? Do they use other illicit products? It's now considered by every quality care organization that has commented on it around the world, that a spiritual assessment is quality medical health care. And the reason is that we know that patients who have religious struggle have more, have poorer health outcomes. They have longer length of stays. They have higher morbidity. They have higher mortality. What I mean by that is patients who become ill and who begin to think, well, is a divine power or is God causing this because of something I've done wrong or something I said wrong? Or is God punishing me for something? Or have I asked God for healing and, and he said, no, has he abandoned me? They begin to think these thoughts. And the majority of our sicker patients think these thoughts. Well, taking a spiritual assessment allows us to understand, do they have any spiritual interest at all? Do they have any spiritual practices that we need to know about? 
if they're members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, we know they have religious restrictions when it comes to blood products. Many of our Hindu and Buddhist, some of our Muslim patients have difficulty with dietary prescriptions that we might give that are religious restrictions. And so taking a spiritual history helps us understand, do they have any religious or spiritual background that's important to them? Do they have a religious or spiritual community that is important to them? Do they have religious or spiritual beliefs that are important to them that we need to know of as we care for them? And if so, then can we offer them religious resources? Perhaps, if they're not Christian, it's offering a religious uh, pastoral professional of their faith to come in to minister to those needs where we can't. But it opens a door to say to the patient, your spiritual and religious beliefs are important to me. I want to honor them. I want to respect them. And to patients who have those religious or spiritual beliefs, to then let them know, if you feel led, that you share religious and spiritual beliefs. One of those is prayer. If you would like you can offer prayer for them. Now, the other side of that question, say, for example, you're working in a system that mandates that you not pray with patients. There are some that teach, well, you should get forgiveness over permission and proceed with God's command that you pray without ceasing. I don't advocate that belief. I'm more on the side of the scriptural mandates that you respect the authority that God places you under, and that you pray for that authority. That's another command that God gives us. So in those cases, for example, in the U.S., even in areas where people are very open to religion and prayer, I tell, still tell residents and students and employed physicians to seek the permission of your employer or to seek the permission of those in authority over you. And I tell them to do it this way. First is to, if your system's not taking a spiritual history, to seek permission for taking a spiritual history, including that in part of your medical record. Secondly, once the system allows you to take a spiritual history, then will it give you permission to do spiritual consults and spiritual referrals to pastoral professionals from that patient's religious background? And will they allow you permission to either call in pastoral professionals to pray or chaplains to pray or pastors, priests, rabbis, monks to pray? Or are they okay with you praying short prayer with a patient with the patient's request and with the patient's permission, and then document that. And so that's kind of in these training programs that I told you about in the resources, there's much more detail on how to do that. And then once you choose to take those steps, to do that with a community of believers who are praying for you, for wisdom and guidance to listen to the soft whisper of the Holy Spirit as he guides you what to say and who to say it with. There are systems where you may be persecuted for that. And then your decision is, do I feel God calling me to pray despite the potential of persecution or not? And Dr. Saunders, that's a highly personal and very difficult prayer. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, for again and again emphasizing the importance of taking a spiritual history and, and knowing your patient and tailoring your approach to the patient. It's not one size fits all. A former chairman of ICMDA, Dr. Peter Ravenscroft, who was a palliative medicine specialist, actually persuaded the medical school in his country to teach every student in this multicultural school how to take a spiritual history. And then it was part of good whole person care. And so it, become part, it became part of the, the standard curriculum that every graduate from this school, which was not a Christian medical school at all, would, would ask at some point, do you have a faith that helps you at times such as this? And In fact, uh, in fact Peter, just to, 
yeah. just a springboard off of that. In the United States now, over 65% of the medical schools require a spiritual history. Over 80% of the hospitals in America require a spiritual history because the organization that certifies, the secular organization that certifies healthcare institutions in the United States requires it. In fact, it's a class A requirement that every patient admitted to the institution, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, have a spiritual history. Why? So that you'll find out what beliefs they have that may impact care. And two, you can provide resources that they that they may need. So it's apart from our biblical Christianity, it is good quality healthcare now for all healthcare professionals to take a spiritual assessment. I, I trained as a surgeon and worked in a mission hospital in Kenya. And of course, in Kenya, most people are uh, at least nominally Christian. I didn't meet anyone who didn't believe in God. And so prayer was just such a part of what we did in the mission hospital. There were talks and prayers every day. And in fact, before every operation with the patient on the table, before they were anesthetized, we prayed. And, uh, and the patient would bow their, would close their eyes on the table and pray as well. Of course, that's a very different situation than what many of our listeners are dealing with. And Kenneth Tan here is writing, He's a medical student in Indonesia. He says, I'm currently in clinical rotations and have tried praying with patients several times in this, this Muslim majority country. How would you communicate your openness for prayer to a patient of a, of a different faith, yeah. especially if it's someone who feels very strongly about their beliefs? Should, should we just not offer prayer to strongly committed Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, and so on, atheists? Uh, or, or is there a way, and, and what would be your wisdom on that? All right, it's a great question. And I uh, hear my, the practice that I'm involved in, I deal with refugees literally of every religious stripe you know, from around the world. And so knowing their, by spiritual assessment, knowing uh, their, their spiritual background and interests, I get a, a sense from the spiritual assessment whether prayer is something that's important to them or not. If it is something that is important to them, then asking for permission to pray with them is something that, mm -hmm. it, that you could consider doing and then praying with them. Now, an issue that comes up as you pray for patients of, of a different religion it, that, that Christians wrestle with is, do I pray in Jesus' name or not? Some wonderful Christian physicians will choose not to pray in Jesus' name out loud because to people of other religions, that name could be an impediment. It could raise a barrier. And so they'll pray in Jesus' name quietly, but not out loud. Other Christian physicians will ask, is it okay if I pray for you? And they'll say, is it okay if I pray in the name of Jesus or Jesu? Uh, with Muslim patients, that's often acceptable. So to be wise in how you do that. Now, in Indonesia, primarily Muslim country, if we talk about the patients that deal with religious struggle, the research shows that Muslim patients that deal with religious struggle primarily deal with guilt. They, it's not uncommon. In fact, one study, 57% of Muslim patients believe they're ill because God's punishing them for something that they didn't do. That religious struggle can impact uh, their recovery, their length of stay, their morbidity, and their mortality. And so there's an openness to prayer. I've, uh, I've never had a Muslim patient say no to prayer. I've had two Buddhist patients say no. They were refugees who came to the country. And on my first visit, uh, I found out that they weren't active with their Buddhism, but they grew up as Buddhists. And so when I offered to pray, the, the no, the, 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 the negative was palpable. I mean, they, it was a mother-daughter. They jumped back. And they said, no, 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 no. I mean, it was just a, and I said, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy not to, not to pray with you. I will be, I didn't tell them this, but I will be praying for you. And I want to come back to that in just a second, but they did come back to me and I never offered prayer again until about six months later, as we, we were talking and the daughter said, do you remember offering prayer to us and, and how we reacted? And I said, I do. I said, I was so sorry that I was offending you, and I, and I appreciate you forgiving me. And they said, do you know why we reacted that way? I said, no. They said, because when we left Myanmar, 
The, the Buddhist priest told us that if you meet a Christian, and if they offer to take you to church or to pray for you, they want to eat you. Because Christians are cannibals. They eat flesh, and they drink blood. That's what they were told. And so when I offered to pray, they thought I wanted them for lunch. <laughs> it was, but it's, it's a kind of comical, except it shows how important it is for as followers of Jesus to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to our patients. We're not there to push or persuade them, but we are there to serve them and to love them. God sent the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, unrighteousness, and judgment, not us. He sent us to love and to serve. And there in Indonesia to figure out, God, how do you want me to do that? And these people who you love, these people who have been deceived, these people that your son died for. And dear Indonesian student, to begin to pray every day for yourself and for the patients that you'll see, and they will see in you because of the Holy Spirit that indwells you, they will see something different and they'll be attracted to that light that's attractive, and they'll be attracted to that salt that is flavorful. And don't be surprised if they don't begin to ask questions. And Peter, in 1 Peter 3.15, says this about sharing our faith. He says, be prepared always to share the faith, be prepared always to defend the faith that lies within you when asked, yet with gentleness and reverence. And brothers and sisters, if your patients are not asking about your faith, then I have to ask you, is your salt too salty or is it unsalty? Is your light unattractive or too bright? And so you can bring God into each, each uh, healthcare setting with your words and with your attitude, and that will speak legions that will allow more of your patients to give you permission when you ask. It's a great question. I apologize for the long answer. <laughs> Just a, another one related to that, Walt, that as a family physician in the US and in lots of cultural contexts, you're alone with the patient for much of the time, but uh, many of our listeners will be practicing medicine or dentistry in a context of a team and and they will be with others when they're going around and uh, Hedwin uh, also from Indonesia is asking what's your suggestion for doctors who work together with a nurse from another religion inside okay. the same room sometimes I ask her to go out to have a private talk to the patients but I don't think we can always or often do that yeah. uh, so uh, working in teams is there a place for prayer and, and how does one wisely and gently go about it? A oh, fabulous question. I work now at the University of Colorado. Uh, and so I'm always with uh, either students, residents, or a witness. Um, in, the, in our country, it's becoming more common for no exams to be performed without witness. And the reason is because of an increasing incidence of accusations for healthcare professionals for inappropriate touch or inappropriate words or what have you. And so I actually see having the witnesses as a, as a positive thing for two reasons. Number one, I have a collaborator of anything that I say that I did or said, <clears throat> I, I have a witness. And number two is then if they're not a believer, my, my witness, my salt and light, is going to two people at the same time. But if I'm going to have an MA, a, a medical assistant for the day, or a nurse, or a student, or a resident, part of my orientation with them is to say, hey, I want you to be aware that I'm a little different than a lot of the doctors you'll work with because of the faith precepts that I believe. I'm a Christian. I believe in God through the sacrifice and death of Jesus. So I'm a follower of Jesus. So that affects what I bring into the exam room, number one. But number two, the very best science we have says that our patients, when they get ill, begin to think spiritual things. So you'll notice that I've taken a spiritual history. And therefore, I may ask the patient some about that. 
I may ask the patient if they want to pray with me. If they give me permission, then I will say a short prayer. Is that something you'd be comfortable with or not? Now, if they're not comfortable, I say, well, then would you want me to have you step out of the room if the patient wants me to say a brief prayer? I've never had an assistant, a resident, or a student say no. In fact, they're curious about how, how I do that. Am I going to try to push something on the patient or sell something to the patient or take um, uh, advantage of the patient uh, to, to push against their vulnerability? No, what they see is a healthcare professional who loves their God and who loves their patients. I want to meet my patient where they are. I don't want them to meet me where I am. I want to meet them where they are because a journey towards Christ, any of you who came to Christ as an adult or an adolescent, we know that for almost all of us, there's a faith journey. There's many, many steps that, that we take. In, in English, it's M-A-N-Y, many steps, M-I-N-I, tiny steps. Sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. And so in that process, we have the opportunity to cultivate our patients for our patients that don't believe in Jesus. And the first step of cultivation isn't that they trust Jesus, it's that they trust a Christian who loves them and meets them where they're at. And in some of our patients, we then get to sow God's word. If there's a principle in God word, God's word that affects their illness or their concern, we can share scripture with permission, with respect, and with sensitivity. And then there's the occasional patient that's ready for a harvest to make a decision. But the vast majority of our patients, we do cultivation. Some we do sowing. And in cultivation, we meet them where they're at with permission, respect, and sensitivity. All of the courses that I mentioned to you, the saline process, spot, faith prescriptions, and um, grace prescriptions, all will go into much more detail on how to do this. And then for my precious Indonesian student, to have other students or other people in your church community that you can talk to and share with and pray with as you begin this process of learning how to be salt and light into the practice that God's called you into. Well, Laramore, thanks very much for being with us today and sharing your wisdom on, on praying with patients and clinical care. It's been uh, really enlightening, wise, encouraging, but also instructive as well. And I'm sure will have given a lot of people confidence. So uh, let me just, uh, in closing, to say thank you again to Walt for giving us your time and to all of you for uh, joining us today. May Lord bless you and we hope to see you again soon.